The idea of rights holds a special place in American political culture. This is particularly true in the realm of criminal law, where ideas like innocent until proven guilty and the requirement of proof beyond a reasonable doubt are celebrated. Perhaps the most famous right established by the Supreme Court's reading of the Constitution is the so-called Miranda Rule, which is meant to prevent police from coercing suspects into confessing to crimes. Many Americans know the Miranda warnings from watching assorted cop shows and legal dramas. How many times have you heard the phrase, you have the right to remain silent? These warnings are so well known from television that a survey found that a majority of young Australians believe that they have the right to Miranda's warnings, even though this right doesn't exist in Australia. But what is the origin of these warnings? Why do they exist? Do they strike the right balance between individual rights and societal interests? Do they really protect citizens from police abuse, as proponents argue? Or do they place too high a cost on law enforcement, as critics contend, allowing criminals to go free for minor police slip-ups? The Miranda Rule can be found, or cannot be found, in the language of the Constitution. It is derived from the Fifth Amendment's right against self-incrimination, which provides no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. The framers of the Constitution were concerned about the exercise of arbitrary power by the government. Guarding against government abuse meant that persons accused of crime should have the right to a fair trial. A suspect, untrained in the complexities of law, should be able to consult a lawyer before talking to governmental officials so that she would know her rights and receive a fair trial. Because trials, at least in theory, are a search for truth, it was recognized in American history that coerced or forced confessions are inherently untrustworthy. The problem, however, is this. How do you encourage voluntary confessions, which are desirable, while at the same time preventing overzealous police officers from compelling suspects to speak? The Supreme Court dealt with this in a 1966 case called Miranda v. Arizona. The case came about like this. In 1963, the police arrested Ernesto Miranda, a schizophrenic with a ninth grade education, as a suspect in the rape of an 18-year-old girl outside of Phoenix, Arizona. There was a police lineup in which the victim identified him as her attacker. Two officers then took Miranda into a separate room. They confronted him with an alleged accomplice to an unrelated crime who accused him of murder. Miranda denied the accusation. He was then handcuffed and made to stand while the officers interrogated him for four hours. He was not advised that he had the right to an attorney or the right to remain silent. He requested to see his attorney, but his request was denied and his attorney was prevented from seeing him and speaking with him. Finally, he confessed and at trial he was convicted based on his confession. The U.S. Supreme Court heard the appeal of his case in 1966. In a divided decision written by Chief Justice Earl Warren, the Supreme Court held that Miranda's conviction was unconstitutional. Warren noted the dangers of what he called modern police interrogation and the danger of coerced confessions. He wrote in part, even without employing brutality or the third degree, the very fact of custodial interrogation exacts a heavy toll on individual liberty and trades on the weakness of individuals. The Supreme Court announced a new rule composed of four warnings that police must give suspects before they are interrogated. They must tell suspects that they have a right to remain silent, that anything they say can be used against them in court, that they have a right to have an attorney present, and that if they cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided to them at state expense. These came to be known as the Miranda warnings. There were three dissents to the decision, and Justice Clark concurred with the majority in part and dissented in part. The most visceral dissent came from Justice White, who wrote that the result of the court's Miranda requirements would be that, in some unknown number of cases, the court's rule will return a killer, a rapist, or other criminal to the streets and to the environment which produced him to repeat his crime whenever it pleases him. The Miranda decision proved extraordinarily controversial. Although most civil liberty advocates welcomed the decision, it was met with widespread hostility from politicians, the police, and large segments of the public. The decision was made at a time when crime was a rising concern, and critics asserted that the decision contributed to crime. 
Two years after Miranda was decided, Congress passed legislation admitting voluntary confessions given without Miranda warnings to be used as evidence in federal courts. The controversy refused to die. Nearly 20 years after the decision, the Attorney General of the United States, Edwin Meese, called it infamous and labeled its supporters in the American Civil Liberties Union the criminals lobby. And the decision probably helped Richard Nixon win the 1968 presidential election as part of his law and order platform. Now what do the critics say about Miranda? They say that the Miranda warnings have no support in history or in the text of the Constitution. They say the requirement is too rigid and leads to even more litigation. They point out that many more cases challenging confessions have been appealed post-Miranda than prior to the decision. They also argue that the decision aids criminals by encouraging criminal defendants to avoid talking to the police at all. The bottom line, critics say, is that Miranda leaves many crimes unsolved and lets criminals escape punishment. Now proponents of Miranda certainly reply. They say first the intent of the Fifth Amendment is unclear and this leaves room for interpretation. They defend the formality of the Miranda rules because they say that formality clearly indicates what police must do when they wish to interrogate suspects. The Miranda warnings, they argue, do not help harden criminals who know to not talk to the police in any case, but do help the poor and uneducated. Miranda, they say, assures the integrity of the adversarial process because it prevents the police from exploiting the psychological vulnerability of citizens. Finally, they say that a study by the American Bar Association shows that the police themselves don't see Miranda as a significant obstacle to their work. Despite continued criticisms and predictions that Miranda would be overturned, the Supreme Court announced a surprising ruling in the year 2000. The court not only reaffirmed Miranda's holding, but also anchored it more firmly in constitutional practice. In a case called Dickerson versus the United States, the court ruled 7-2 that the Miranda warnings were a constitutional mandate that could not be overruled by state courts or federal legislation. In a scathing dissent, Justice Scalia accused the court of judicial imperialism. He insisted that the text of the Constitution provides no basis for the court's decision. Let me quote you what he wrote. He wrote, today's judgment converts Miranda from a milestone of judicial overreaching into the very Cheops pyramid of judicial arrogance. Despite this accusation, the majority in Dickerson wrote that Miranda has become embedded in routine police practice to the point where the warnings have become part of our national culture. So the Miranda warnings are alive and well, which is more than we can say for Ernesto Miranda. He was killed in a barroom brawl 10 years after his case was decided. It would probably be small comfort to him to know that his killer was likely given his Miranda warnings.